All right. Welcome to the inaugural Zephyr Learning Session. The Zephyr Foundation's mission is to advance rigorous transportation and land use decision making for the public good by advocating for and supporting improved travel analysis and facilitating its implementation. Before we begin today's webinar, I just want to make a few notes. Um, the participation requires compliance with the Zephyr Code of Contact. Essentially, please be respectful. If you need help using any of the Zoom features, uh, contact the Zephyr admin via the Zoom chat function or via email. We are recording today's webinar. Uh, so if you are participating, it means you've given permission uh, for us to record and distribute this webinar. All right, let's get started. So to the session today titled A System Dynamics Perspective for Transportation Planning Under Certainty was originally planned as a full session at the now canceled TRB Innovations and Travel Modeling Conference. The session was part of the strategic tools group of sessions within the useful forecast track of the conference. The sessions had the collective goal of sharing novel approaches or multi-scenario tools that focus on helping us better understand forecast uncertainties rather than trying to polish a single future scenario. I am pleased to introduce Hannah Redkoff from the USDOT Volpe National Transportation Systems Center, who will be leading today's discussion. Hannah brought system dynamics modeling to the Volpe Center's work on understanding the impacts of automated vehicles. As part of this, she developed partnerships with researchers at MIT and various European research institutions to help auto industry analysts and public sector planners understand the range of possible futures. Prior to joining the USDOT in 2015, Ms. Rakoff spent over a decade improving transportation asset management models and working on business and industrial process improvement in the UK and Canada. It is also important to note that she is a trained Sigma, Six Sigma black belt. Hannah, the webinar is all yours. Thank you, Rachel, for that nice introduction. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay, Rachel? I can hear you. Perfect, okay. Great, so before we get started, um, let me just run over a couple more things on this intro slide. Um, first of all, for questions, um, we will be doing a presentation at the beginning and then we will be doing a live exercise where we'll try to build a model together. So during those portions, all the participants will be on mute. Um, and we ask that you put questions into the chat box. My colleagues, Scott Smith and Ian Berg will be monitoring that and we'll flag if there's something where we should stop and clarify. Um, but otherwise, we'll be holding questions. And then during the exercise part, they'll be bringing forward your points live as you make them. Unfortunately, with um, nearly 100 people registered, we weren't able to actually have folks speak at that point. However, in the discussion point, in the discussion portion afterwards, we ask that you use the little raise your hand feature on Zoom. And then one of us will recognize you and unmute you, and then we would like you to speak. Um, so we'll, we'll get things a bit more interactive as we, as we go along. Um, and with that, let's get started. So the motivation behind this session is that transportation planners, look, all of you, trans planners, modelers, whether you call it that or not, you're doing a lot of planning under deep uncertainty, and it's not getting any easier um, in the current situation. So you need a way to look at very different scenarios without spending a lot of time on each one up front. And we wanted to bring you a system dynamics perspective as another arrow in your toolbox for working on that. Um, let me go ahead and introduce, okay, there's our USDOT disclaimer. This is us, we're not talking for the government here. Um, let me go ahead and show you the agenda and introduce um, our panelists today. So, after this introduction, we'll be turning it over to Jeremy Roth, the Federal Highway Administration, who will be talking about the larger context of planning under uncertainty. Um, then we'll be going to a systems perspective where my colleague Jing Shaw and I will be talking about um, why system dynamics, systems perspective in general and system dynamics in particular can be helpful. And then we'll be going into the interactive exercise. And then finally, there's plenty of time for free discussion. So let me read the intros for my illustrious co-panelists before we get started. First up, Jeremy Raw, professional engineer, is a community planner in the Federal Highway Administration Office of Planning. 
where he coordinates research and deployment of data collection and analysis techniques and modeling for transportation planning, as well as planning applications for national data sets. His work areas include data collection, analysis, and modeling for bicycle and pedestrian transportation, planning for connected and automated vehicles, scenario planning, and developing strategic planning models. And my favorite part is that Jeremy holds degrees in philosophy, literature, engineering, and city planning. Um, next, after Jeremy speaks, we'll be hearing from Jingsa Shaw at the Volpe Center. Dr. Shaw is a technology policy analyst at the US DOT Volpe Center. She supports projects focused on connected and automated vehicles, data collected using those CAV technologies, and evaluating policy implications. Before joining Volpe, Dr. Shaw was a postdoc associate at MIT. Her work focused on improving behavioral models on residential relocation behavior and vehicle ownership choices to capture the effects of government intervention on individuals' decision making. Dr. Shaw received her PhD in urban and regional planning from MIT. And then we also have with us um, Scott Smith and Ian Berg. So Dr. Smith is a senior operations research analyst with more than 25 years of experience in applying technology to improve transportation operations and safety across all modes. Scott's work has included impact assessment for automation and support to FHWA on advanced travel modeling. He is U.S. co-chair of the impact assessment subgroup of the trilateral, that's Europe, U.S., and Japan, trilateral automation and road transportation working group. Before joining Volpe, Dr. Smith worked in private industry developing decision support tools to assist motor carriers and railroads with operations and shippers with transportation procurement. He holds a doctorate in civil engineering from MIT. And last but not least, Ian Berg. Ian Berg is a technology policy analyst at the Volpe Center. Much of Ian's work involves the impacts that automated vehicles may have on the transportation system from using system dynamics to investigate scenarios for future AV deployment to researching how human drivers interact with AVs and traffic. Ian holds degrees in urban and regional planning and in mathematics. So with that, over to you, Jeremy. Make sure I'm unmuted there and that my clock is going so I don't talk away the rest of the afternoon because we've got a lot of interesting stuff to do here. Um, so I, my, my con primary connection to planning under uncertainty has been working on strategic models, and I've been doing this for a number of years since before uncertainty really got to be the thing, in particular working on this Vision Eval strategic modeling project. I'm going to talk very briefly about Vision Eval uh, as part of this presentation, but I will point out Vision Eval is not really a system dynamics model in the sense that we're talking about them later in this presentation. It has elements of that and certainly can be used to support the same kind of analytic approach but it's, uh, it, it has a more linear structure, uh, and, and we'll come back to that and what it means and, and what we're really trying to get to as we push to the next level in thinking about how to model effectively for uncertainty. So to start out, I'm going to back up a little bit to the question of what's uncertain? And part of this, of course, is the future itself. We don't really know what's going to happen. We start looking at the travel behavior that's going on and try to get a sense for what's going to come next. Um, you know, obviously, things today are very different than they were even four months ago. Um, that there's been a, a sort of revolutionary change in the transportation system. And there is an open question about when and how we actually return to what we were doing before, or whether we ever do. Those kinds of questions really are just, you know, the, the front edge of a set of questions that have been developing or questions related to, you know, rising sea levels, adjustment and, and for resilience in that area, uh, questions around what happens with connected or automated vehicles, with new technologies, micromobility. I mean, there are a whole bunch of things happening in the transportation world, all of which raise questions about what are people going to do? But the deeper question with uncertainty actually goes beyond just the what happens next, because, of course, with the models, we're always interested in why it's happening. And a lot of what really sets apart transportation, say, from just the physical movement of a vehicle on the surface of a road is that there's an intentional component to it. We wonder about why people are doing this and our explanations of what's going on are almost as important as the physical phenomenon itself. And, and so what we need to do is in, in order to, to handle the uncertainty and to really think about these new conditions is to recognize first of all, that 
a lot of the modeling structures that we've put in place and have treated as certainties, the components of our utility functions, the fact that we revolve everything around value of time, that we consider economic constraints on what people are doing, are not necessarily adequate to capture the particular processes that lead to the behavior we're observing. And, and I'm emphasizing it and unpacking it in that way because a lot of what we're gonna try to get a hold of with the systems dynamics is what are the factors that influence each other? How does this whole machine work to produce the things that we see in the world around us? And there is this recognition that how that happens is itself something that's under change. And this is something that's actually been recognized for a long time in time series analysis, if we're looking at the change in, in data patterns over time. Uh, and a lot of the time series modeling that we try to do uh, attempts to reel back that data into a place where we can assume that the process generating the data is the same across time. I, you know, there, there are technical terms around the stationarity, for example, that says that the, the sort of covariance structure of the process doesn't change as time goes on. And you can step back and have autoregressive processes and things that attempt to cope for the shifts because they themselves are regular. But in the absence of large amounts of data, it's very hard to know how to make that compensation. We take these reckless leaps into modeling the world and making assumptions about what the relationships are without necessarily fully understanding the consequences. So actually, um, Hannah, if you could move on to the next slide, I think I'm ready to take that one on. Um, so I, I, this is a slide that we've used in the VDOT or the, the vision eval training. I, I gave it to VDOT recently, which is why I'm misspeaking. Uh, but the, the, this was developed in, by Oregon DOT. I think the diagram actually came from somewhere else originally, or at least the concept of it. And so they have their storm analysis toolkit. It's not accidental that the little inverted triangle is supposed to remind you of a tornado. Uh, and I'm actually going to lean on that in my explanation of this. The idea is that a lot of the modeling and the decision making that we're doing now uh, where we have very little difficulty, very little capacity to settle all the assumptions that we need in, in order to do very detailed models and understand exactly what's going to happen next. A lot of the modeling is really about exploring possibilities of you know, what if the phenomena were structured like this? What if the relationships were different than what we've always taken into account? And that's really the world of strategic modeling. All the ferment and energy is happening up at the top of this. And then we gradually move down into increasingly more precise and more detailed modeling, where at every step as we move down that ladder, we've made more fixed assumptions about the particular characteristics of the project or the thing that we're trying to model. And of course, if we do that without having some confidence in what those assumptions are, by the time we get to the tip of this triangle at the bottom in the operations, we will have total chaos. It really will be a storm that uh, our models have basically led us away from the reality and we don't understand what's going on because of building up to that point or drilling down to it, I guess the way the diagram is organized, we made assumptions that it turns out were not the right ones. And so what we're gonna try and do at the strategic level is really think about assumptions that might help us be ready for the unexpected, interpret the data that comes at us correctly so that we can understand relationships that we might not have thought about before. We can look for the places we really need to put attention to because those are the ones where big effects might happen and other things that we we worry about might in fact not be significant at all. So let's, let's have the next slide. And um, I, I don't wanna to stick too long with this and I'm probably gonna beat my 15 minutes unless people are asking me hard questions. I don't dare look at the chat pod yet. Um, the schematic for vision eval here and, and what we'll sort of compare this a little later to the schematics for a more fully developed system dynamics model uh, is to essentially go through a process of simulation where at every step in this process, start Starting with defined households, assigning land use, assigning transportation system, we walk, walk through a series of numeric steps or numbered steps here. They're, they're sequential steps where each one is building on using information computed in the previous step and making some adjustments. And along the way, and, and the unique characteristic that I'm not showing on this slide about Vision Eval is that you can play with things that are not just the base scenario. So we're not just going to start with land use and employment, jobs and housing the way we would in a traditional regional model, for example. We're instead going to say that's one of the components, 
But along the way, we've got development pressures that we can look at in land use and policies that might affect that. We can look at the transportation system and ask not just about, you know, how much transit do we have, but about the relative usage of that so that we can assume, make assumptions about if transit usage were to increase, if auto travel were to go down, if there were to be certain effects of um, the new micro mobility on certain types of trips. And we're going to keep nuancing and adjusting with the opportunity to introduce not just a fixed situation that we're trying to evaluate, but a set of parameters about assumptions and how those fixed situations and the components of that might interact with each other in order to come up with a very flexible estimate that takes into account a lot of things in, in the case of vision eval that typically don't appear or are more difficult to capture in a standard travel demand model. Uh, so turning away from vision eval for a minute and then just saying, so what does all of this mean? I, I'm, I'm going to take a step back and say the key piece in the system's dynamics and the, and the approach to uncertainty is to allow that even though we don't know what the conditions are going to be in the future and even necessarily all of the relationships, that is not to say we know nothing. The fact that we can't simply go on doing models as we have always been doing them uh, does not mean that we cannot model anything and it does not mean we do not know things about the world. Uh, one, of, one of the examples I like to appeal to or an approach to, to doing um, estimates of things that we can't really fully get our arms around is a thing called Fermi estimation after Enrico Fermi, the nuclear physicist who, who played a parlor game with people where they would ask him to make an estimate of certain quantities that nobody has any information on. The classic example, how many piano tuners are there in the city of Chicago? And even without knowing anything about that, you could start doing basic samples. Do I know people with pianos? How often do they get them tuned? How many people are there in the city of Chicago? And at the rate that I'm looking at, how many pianos would there be? How frequently are they tuned? That implies there are so many people. How much do piano tuners work in the course of a week? I can make guesses about all of those things and end up with a surprisingly accurate estimate of the result. All of which is contingent on a lot of assumptions about what's the same and what's different. You know, I, I mean, I, I, we can start adding in all kinds of other constraints. For the piano tuners, we could look at socioeconomic class. I happen to live in an upper middle class environment where lots of people have pianos, but maybe for other people who do not have those resources or the big enough house to really accommodate it, they don't have as many pianos. As soon as we start getting into those kinds of relationships, that's when we're pushing into system dynamics because we're starting to ask questions about larger influences, other things that might be happening. And instead of applying a narrow set of assumptions that we really learned how to do over the last 50 years for a fairly narrow approach to how we build transportation facilities and manage them, we can open up the door and start asking more useful questions. And the neat thing about system dynamics and, and even about vision of is that you don't have to build an enormous, cumbersome, complicated, detailed model in order to get very useful insights out of it about where to put your efforts, what data we should be collecting, what kinds of uh, particular interventions we could make that would get us the biggest bang for the buck. So the result and the thing that I find particularly exciting about this approach is our capacity to really deploy all the knowledge we have. You know, much as I do, I mean, Hannah commented on my educational background and I thought, huh, I wonder what kind of job I could get where I've got degrees in literature, philosophy, engineering, and city planning. I mean, where could I possibly go with that? And here I am. Uh, actually making use of almost all of those things. I don't get to speak French much, but that's about the only place that doesn't uh, actually get deployed a lot in what I do. I tell stories, um, hopefully pretty accurate ones. I talk about the philosophy of this stuff and the rest. But the key thing, and, and just to bring this back into a more general point, is to say, all of the things that we know about the world, the things we see and the ways we've interacted with it become the raw material for understanding what's going to come next. The future is not disconnected to the past, even though it's going to contain things that we've never seen before. And so what we're going to try and do with the system dynamics approach, and we'll take this through with the presentation and then we'll get down into a, an actual exercise so you can get a feel for how you do this stuff. Um, all of that is part of making the most of what we've accumulated over the years in terms of knowledge and understanding and, and recognition of the importance and, and relative unimportance of certain things. And we can ask questions about what part of that is going to change, what's going to be the same, 
and what would it mean to us if, if different combinations of things actually came about. So I'm actually a couple of minutes ahead of my time at this point, and I think I've, that I've probably said enough on this, but at least have warmed you up to the idea that we can be both intensely uncertain and also know a great deal and make a great uh, contribution based on that knowledge to helping to navigate those uncertainties. So uh, I'll stop with that and maybe we will, um, I'm, I'm running down the chat pod just to see if there's a question. Um, there is. Okay, there is one at the very bottom. I did not see any risk analysis as part of your model and how it will fit on the travel demand model. Uh, I, I guess, and that really means, what do we mean by risk analysis? I mean, you know, and, and I, the thing I didn't mention about vision eval, for example, and, and this is a characteristic of a lot of system dynamics exercises is, we want to evaluate different scenarios. The thing that Vision ML makes it particularly easy to do is to set up a base series of, of future years that we think this is how the world will play out and then start tinkering with the assumptions. The model, even though it does a fair amount of complicated stuff, runs quickly. And a typical Vision eval installation will evaluate hundreds or even thousands of different scenario combinations with the intent of looking at the relative outputs uh, comparing if we were to make certain type of, types of interventions, if demographics were to shift in a particular way, what would that look like in terms of outcomes measured in terms of performance measures of significance? And so the idea there is to use the dynamics that are coded into this model to understand the relative risk if certain types of inputs change or if certain assumptions prove not to be uh, the right ones. Uh, in, in reality. So again, a lot of the assumptions we don't know, so we're going to try out different ones and we're going to understand, hmm, if this thing happens, there's a risk that, you know, our particular performance measure could balloon or collapse and we would see something very different than we were hoping for. And so the part of the risk management is really about running these different scenarios and understanding the interactions from the standpoint of what's their effect going to be on the stuff that I really care about. Um, can we give an example of how vision eval has been used? Absolutely. Uh, I can give you a couple. Uh, most commonly, I, I mean, the original application to which this applied was greenhouse gas analysis in the state of Oregon. And, and the whole concept was developed because uh, in order to meet a very aggressive goal of 70% reduction by, I think, 2040, the, the, the quest was, what could we do that could conceivably get us that reduction? Recognizing that there were interventions that were uh, politically costly, uh, but relatively easy, and other ones that were, you know, perhaps complicated from an engineering standpoint, but easier to sell to people, but maybe with less effect. And so the model was put together so we could look at lots of combinations of stuff and see what the outcomes are. And actually, it's still used that way for policy analysis in Oregon. I mean, enlarged actually beyond just questions of greenhouse gas analysis and to look at issues of VMT mode share uh, and so on. Uh, similar uses have been applied in, in other, other places. The Atlanta Regional Commission has used Vision Eval to uh, uh, set up scenarios for discussion with the public where the idea was to uh, pre-compute a bunch of different uh, possible combinations of assumptions and then put those in front of the public and allow people to explore sort of interactively what would this look like if we made different assumptions about different kinds of activities? And this is a way of building public uh, confidence in, in the forecasts and in the decisions that are being made in response to circumstances where we can't have full knowledge about what's going to happen. Um, there, there are some other examples as well, but certainly it's been, uh, it's been deployed that way, largely to facilitate a planning discussion. Remember the, from the storm model that we looked at a second ago, at the strategic level, we, we presume this is happening early in the planning process and it's setting the larger direction so that once we've decided that, you know, investing in transit or, uh, um, you know, promoting shared mobility of some sort might be an appropriate strategy, we can then start asking the more detailed tactical and operational questions about what would we actually have to do to realize those benefits. So this is part of a larger set of models. It doesn't replace anything, but it, it gives us that chance to do effective advanced thinking and make sure that things are not going to uh, go badly wrong for us later on. All right. Um, I think that's probably enough. I've now as I, as I was about not to do for the first time in recorded history, go over time. I'm now over time a little bit, and I'm going to turn this back over to Hannah and Jing Su to get down to the really interesting stuff, which is how do we do system dynamics and what does it mean for us? Great. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Um, really appreciate that. I just added he can practice his French with me when he'd like. 
Um, so uh, what I what I want to highlight quickly before turning it over to Jing Su is that um, Jeremy pointed out that what happened in the past is relevant even if the future is different, and that's something that we will see um, come back in in some of the system dynamics work that that we're going to talk about. That the past reference mode is relevant even if the exact values of the parameters or some of the relations could be totally different going forward. So with that, let me turn it over to Jing Su. Um, take it away, Jing Su. Let me know when you'd like me to advance the slides. Uh, thank you, Hannah, and thank you, Jeremy, for providing the big context of strategic models and then how system dynamics models can fit in as a complementary tool to allow modelers explore the complicated interactions among agents and then their response to a large number of variables. So to begin with our presentation today, we will introduce two examples to explain what a system's perspective is, and you may realize that you are more familiar with a system's perspective than you thought. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, first, let's start uh, with a case of purchasing toilet paper. Uh, as individual consumers, we all have the needs to, uh, to purchase toilet paper. Uh, we go to retailers such as supermarkets to purchase toilet paper based on our projected needs. And then the retailer order toilet paper from suppliers based on their projected quantities that they observe from the individual consumer side. Uh, next slide, please. And then recently, since the coronavirus crisis began, there was a trigger that changed the behavior of individual consumers. Uh, for instance, as more and more people started working from home, it leads to the demand shift from business users to home users. We observed individual consumers started over, over order toilet paper. And as a result, the retailer sees that their shelves are empty. And this sent up a signal to consumers that there may be a shortage of toilet paper, which could lead to more consumers overordering and then stuck in a vicious cycle. And then meanwhile, as retailers experience the shortage of toilet paper, they need to increase their order from the suppliers to avoid running short on the inventories. However, in the long term, you can imagine retailers could make decisions among several options. Uh, for instance, they can consider reducing their orders given that the demand of individual consumers could drop in a few months or keep their order or uh, overordering uh, decision or increasing the order to an even higher level. So in general, individuals and the retailers have more flexibility to adjust their orders compared with uh, suppliers and then to understand whether the system can reach to a new equilibrium between supply and demand we need an analytical tool to model the behavior of the system. And then next slide, please. And then the second example we want to show is a framework for transportation and the new technologies that we're uh, familiar with. So in order to understand the wider context in which automated vehicles will operate, uh, my colleagues Hannah, Scott, uh, and the two European researchers and I developed a framework which identifies the major generic roles within the transportation system and then considers how they interact within the context of both traditional and new modes. In this framework, we highlight the roles of various types of entities. Uh, from this figure, you can see uh, on the left-hand side, uh, we highlight the, um, the roles, um, including the end users of the transportation system, and then the box in the middle highlight the entities that can control the availability of transportation to end users. And then the box on the right highlighted the roles um, that the infrastructure and the technology providers play. So this piece of work goes on to identify agents within the system with specific relevance to AVs and then suggest the short-term and the long-term goals of the agent in each role as well as how automation may affect the agents in ways relevant to their goals. So along with our European collaborators, we developed and published this piece of work to encourage researchers to dive into a particular part of it and build a specific SD model that can answer their research questions. And if you're interested in the detail of this work, uh, please check the link on the slides and take, and take a close look at the paper. Uh, next slide, please. 
So as uh, most of, uh, many of us here are travel and demand modelers, one key motivation of developing models is to improve our understanding of how people make travel decisions. Uh, a uh, systems perspective also focuses on the decision-making process of key entities. Uh, in addition, it motivates modelers to expand their mod uh, mental models of a system by taking the side effects of the decision-making process into consideration, and then also consider other agents' behavior and then the related side effects generated from their decisions. Um, I will stop here, and then next, my colleague Hannah will introduce the high-level concepts of system dynamics by ways of examples titled transportation. And then the goal is to provide the concepts to understand and then participate in the interactive model exercise to follow. Great, thank you, Jingzi. So um, we're gonna move now into a little bit more formal, a little bit more about the more formal notation of system dynamics. I, it's probably a misnomer that I called this more formal system dynamics because um, as you know, as a modeler, the way you write it down doesn't change what you know, the thought process behind it, but it does allow you to communicate your thoughts in a way that, that is sort of understood by everybody who's working with that type of model. So, um, first gonna talk about causal loop diagrams. So, we had in, in um, Jingso's examples, you could see that there were links, causal links going on between, for instance, people's purchasing behaviors and how much a retailer would order, how much a supplier would, um, would try to, uh, to, to make in their plant. Um, here's a case that is maybe a little bit closer to your, your daily work. So um, I should first talk about the arrows and the little plus signs on the arrows. So arrows here are representing causal links and they're saying that all else equal, there's a link between what's at the base of the arrow and what's at the head of the arrow, which is causal. And if there's a plus sign, it means that all else equal when the first factor increases, the second factor will also increase. And it holds in the other direction as well. So when the influencing factor decreases, the influenced factor, all else equal, moves in the same direction and also therefore decreases. So you can think of a plus sign as meaning that they go in the same direction, and in a moment, we'll see a minus sign, and that means they go in the opposite direction. So here, for instance, if you have a, um, a bus route that has a rising daily ridership, all else equal, that would help you make the business case for more service. Um, and then with some delay, which could be very long, but it would tend to lead to a higher frequency of buses, all else equal. Um, which increases the perceived utility and then attracts more people onto the route. So you have what's called the reinforcing loop, a virtuous circle that's leading you further and further away from your uh, initial point. Should point out that this same loop holds if you're going the other direction. If we're talking in non-pandemic conditions here to, to make things simple. If there's a decrease in ridership, that decreases your business case for more service. Maybe it creates a business case for less service. At some point, you might have to cut some buses. That decreases the utility, and then fewer people want to ride, and you can have decreasing ridership. The point is, in either case, a reinforcing loop is moving you further and further away from your starting point. But of course, that's not the only thing going on. Um, also, it, as daily ridership, remember this is in pre-pandemic conditions here to keep it simple. Daily ridership on this route is increasing, let's say, as it goes up, there is a minus marked arrow there, which means it's moving in the other direction. Um, fraction of passengers with seats decreases as daily ridership goes up. So more ridership, but now fewer of them can sit. So here now it's staying in the same direction. So lower fraction of passengers with seats leads to lower average perceived utility, all else equal, which leads to lower daily ridership. So if ridership increases, here, this balancing loop goes around and pushes it back. So on the left, a reinforcing loop is tending to take you further and further away from your starting point. And a balancing loop is tending to push back the perturbation away from the starting point and balance you moving back to um, where you began. So, okay, I think 
go out on a limb and say that there's no big shocker here, right? But of course, what happens when you put them together? Now what? Um, it becomes very difficult to guess in your mind what are the sets of parameters that will lead to an overall increase, an overall decrease. Maybe it goes up for a while and then it goes down or down for a while and then it goes up. Because of course, the daily, there's only one daily ridership on the route and there's only one average perceived utility. What was in the separate, separate loops before is part of the same whole system. Um, and John Sturman, who's one of the leading lights in MIT, writing in a very influential textbook uh, for system dynamics um, published in 2000, uh, wrote that we are unable to infer correctly the dynamics of all but the simplest causal map. So if you were modeling something even like this, you'd really need to run simulations. And the point of the exercise that we're about to get into is not to run the simulations per se, but to show you how you set up something like this, which you can then simulate. Um, so with that, let me pass it back to Jingso to explain the context around the exercise. Over to you, Jingso. Uh, thank you, Hannah. So Hannah and I will work on this case study, and then you uh, will help us uh, to build this model like in the next 30 minutes. So the case we are going to introduce today is the traffic fatality during a low vehicle mile travel period in Massachusetts. Uh, we can move to the next slide, please. Okay. So the Regional Transportation Agency, MassDOT, reported the rate of fatality in April 2020 doubled compared with that of last year. So from this table, you can see the total number of crash deaths in April 2019 was 27. And then the total traffic volume was at a normal level. Uh, it's 100%. And then, however, the traffic volume dropped to half in April 2020. Uh, as we observed. And then the total number of crash deaths uh, was almost the same as last year. And that leads to the conclusion uh, for MassDOT to report that the rate of fatalities doubled this year. So as modelers and then policymakers, we would, under, uh, we would like to understand the relationship between the rate of fatality and then key factors. And then what has been changed in the transportation system that could lead to the high rate of fatality on the road during the low VMT period. So let's um, do some exercise here to try to understand some key questions that we want to address. Uh, next slide, please. So the first uh, set of questions that we want to understand are the, what are the key roles in the system? So we identify three key roles here. The first type is drivers, and then their attributes, including the demographics of the drivers, the type of destinations they drive to, the type of vehicles they drove, the time of the day that a trip occurred, and also whether drivers chose to follow safety routes, uh, such as avoiding speeding, uh, wearing seatbelt, uh, or obeying hands-free rules. And then the second type of the roads is the other road users, including pedestrian and the bicyclists. The third type of roads uh, we identify here is the state of the transportation system. For instance, what is the speed limit of a road versus the actual speed on the road? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another set of questions we would like to consider is what has been changed before and after the pandemic related travel decreases? Uh, we can imagine all these three uh, type of entities change their behavior. Uh, we can imagine the characteristics of drivers during um, driving on the road during the pandemic can change. And also we observe that more people uh, taking walks and biking during the day. Uh, people who walk and bike have changed their behavior such as crossing streets frequently. Um, of course, trying to keep a safe social distance. And then lastly, we observe less traffic and the increased actual speed. Um, so under the new circumstances, our question could be whether the driver will follow the speed limit or exceed the limit. Uh, next, Hannah will show you how to develop a system, uh, system dynamic framework to understand the relationship between fatalities and the key factors and uh, how they could influence the behavior of a system. Okay, Great, Hannah, thank you very much. Your turn. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you very much, Jingsa. 
So, yes, yeah, so we're going to go into the exercise and try to identify the simplest causal structure that can explain the observed behavior. So loosely speaking, the steps you take in doing this are to identify the key factors. Jing has set us off with some, and on the moment I'll show you some others we've thought of. Um, indicate the causal links that you think um, are, are connecting between those factors, so connecting those dots, and putting a polarity on them. So if one goes up, does the one it's connected to tend to go up or tend to move in the other direction and go down? And then identify the loops which can, which can help you start thinking about um, the feedback within the structure. This is the part that we will try to do today. Normally, this would be done, so at the Volpe Center, we do it on whiteboards and small groups um, when it's just our team. Um, if we had done this at the Innovations and Travel Modeling Conference, we were planning to split attendees into tables and have maybe four or five tables where you'd be working with post-its. It would have been nice because we would have had an opportunity to see different opinions, but I think we can still get that today. This is not something you should do alone or in a vacuum. The idea of doing it as a group is that you're getting people who know more or less about different pieces of the system to work together to help you get the overall structure from what's going on in each piece of it. And I'll just say if we were to continue past what we're going to do today, the next steps would be to build a formal model. So obviously a causal loop diagram is nice, but you need to specify the mathematical relationships, try out numbers, simulate it, compare it with the observed behavior. And then if it's not matching the behavior well, you can add more structure and more detail, but you, you should really only do that if you need it. The goal is not, you know, if we're keeping a strategic model, the goal is not to model the whole world here. It's to model the particular phenomenon you're interested in, which might be very small, and then maybe you need another model for another piece of it. Um, but you may be keeping a broad model boundary, although you're not modeling everything within it. So you're not detailed, but you could be broad. So because we can't do the post-it thing on the computer, we're going to use Benson, which is one of uh, several well-known system dynamics modeling software. It's usually you wouldn't go to software this early, but it's the best way to um, be able to draw causal links together um, while sharing the screen. So before that, move things along a little bit. Here is the universe of factors that we have thought off in advance that appear relevant yeah. in, um, in the case that Jinx outlined for us. Um, you might have others you think are really important. There might be someone here you think really, um, from your experience, don't are really completely unrelated. Um, and we can talk about that as we get into the exercise. So I'm going to pull up the Vensim uh, file now. And we'd like to get your ideas going in the chat. And my colleagues will be bringing those forward as we draw the connections together. So give me a moment to swap over which file I'm sharing here. And Hannah, this is Scott. While you're doing that, uh, it would be nice to switch your chat to all panelists and attendees uh, so the other attendees can see what's going on. My chat or you're talking to everybody? Yeah, uh, I, I talk for everybody. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, when we ask for input. Oh, yes, absolutely. Please, thank you for for reminding that. Let me just move around, put, um, put the file we're looking at on my bigger screen here. This is something which would have been easier at the office, also quite a bit cooler with the government paying the air conditioner. Um, okay, can you guys see now the same factors, but with a couple of arrows starting to appear? We see the slides, Hannah. You still see the spot. Okay. Now do you see the yes. Vincent file? Okay, great. Perfect. All right. Yeah. So, thank you. So, it's the same set of points that we saw on the slide. Um, we started off with identifying a couple of points that we posit have an important um, uh, initial and sort of drive the, the beginning behavior of the system. So as the pandemic severity increases, 
there's a minus sign here. So that's decreasing in general comfort with public spaces and is decreasing the fraction of schools and businesses that are open as there are school and business closures. So I'll let you think about that for a moment and start putting ideas into the chat pod about other links that we should be drawing and I can start drawing them. So I'll give one example, for instance. Um, I think that comfort with public spaces in general increases transit ridership because you're sharing a vehicle, you have to wait in public for the vehicle to come, you have to walk to and from the stop in many cases. So I think there's a some sort of causal link there and that that's a positive sign. Oh goodness, don't freeze up now. Oh all right. I did not intend to share that to stop that, but it must have crashed for a second. I'll let you keep putting uh, your ideas in while I go and reopen that file. Yes. We got participants sharing their ideas about how to link the factors. This is great. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Can you see the screen again? Yes. Yes. It's back. Yes. Okay. So let me do one link just to show you sort of where we're going and pray that this will work now. We said that this was a positive correlation. Ah, okay, great. So I can mark it as positive. And now we would say that as pandemic severity increases, comfort with public spaces decreases, and then this one's going in the same direction, so transit ridership falls. Okay, so I'll turn it over to you guys. Um, what are we seeing in the chat pod? Sure. Uh, okay, there, there are some of these. There, there are good, there's good input. Uh, goes a little later. So we have uh, more transit ridership less to less VMT. So that's a minus, yes, that's a minus blank. Okay, in this case, of course, it's going the other way. It's less transit ridership leading to more VMT. Okay. And, uh, and then, all right, pandemic severity decreases transit ridership. Uh, this is Scott again. I'll, I'll make a comment on that. Usually you try to break it down as to why that is. So we do have that link from pandemic severity to less comfort with public spaces. And then if you have less comfort with public spaces, there's less transit ridership. So that link is already there if the comforts with the comfort of public spaces in the middle. Uh, I, that is that. Sorry, can I cut in for one second, Scott? Please. I was gonna say that is absolutely true, but you could also have a second link going another way. So there might be another link there, which would tend to lead things the other direction. So just, um, so uh, let's see, average employment income yeah. and um, cars per capita. You, you can see that if we were doing this with more time, we would be thinking more about making these something you could measure. I'm not doing that. So there could yeah. be something driving it the other way. No one's pretending this is the only link. So say uh, pandemic severity is, has reduced average employment income and average employment income is associated with cars. So that would be a positive sign. So pandemic severity has reduced employment income, reduced cars per capita it might be pushing people who really would rather not because they're not very comfortable, but they have no other choice to get to their essential job, might be pushing them onto transit. Did I get the links right? Pandemic severity is up, yeah. employment income is down, cars per capita is down, and people are pushed back onto mm -hmm. transit. So Scott's absolutely right that if we're looking for a way that transit has fallen, unless there's some other mechanism, this seems like a pretty reasonable one, but there could be other links going the other way. And 
I'll leave that there just yeah. as the example, although it's a little hard to read. Okay. And, and then, uh, Scott, again, I think I've also seen in the chat pod, uh, you know, the, the fraction of schools open going to less exercise at the gym because it's closed in school. Uh, sorry, this chat, this is wonderful. It's just it's taking me a minute to scan it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and then the decrease. And then the decrease in exercise at the gym. Yeah. Yeah, these okay. are positive. Okay. And then the decrease in exercise at the gym. So you have a negative link between the gym mm -hmm. and leisure walking and biking. Right. Less exercise at the gym mm -hmm. leads to more leisure walking and biking. So that's negative. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And then um, there's also. Um, Folks have brought up the link between schools and businesses being open. Um, the more schools and businesses are open, the less the er, the more schools and businesses are open, the more VMT there is. So this is a positive link. Yeah. And in this case, because yeah. whoops, because those because that's going down, both are going down. Yeah. Yeah. All mm -hmm. right. And and Canna, sorry, this is Scott again. There were a couple of comments here which I think we want to address on mm. the time scale of the changes. And one okay. nice thing about systems, so basically the comment was essentially, hey, this cars per capita is on a much longer time scale than everything else. There's a real mm. delay going into it. And that is absolutely true. So and I think this is one area where the, this type of modeling can do really well. So Hannah, do you want to go further on that? Um, I will just, this is not an ad for Benson, but I will just show you that there is a way it didn't, it's kind of hard to see, but you can, there is in causal yeah. loop diagrams, a notation that little two yeah. little lines represent a delay there. And thank you for picking that up because I, I had missed that. And you might not want to put this all in one model because you're getting what's called a fast and slow problem where there's two very different yeah. time scales going on. Um, so yeah. this might not be a great thing to show here, but I'm glad we showed it because it let us talk about the delay. The and it's actually there. a very, it's a very important point for this type of modeling, like even on our generic model the, or the bus provider that you know, there's a time delay before you can put on more service on a transit route, and that's true of, you know, many businesses. And being able to model that when you're dealing with a new mode or something very new is an important capability to have. So if I, are we ready? Can we link up the vulnerable road users over here? Have there been any comments about yeah. how we can link that up? Oh, yeah, yeah. People are making comments on DMT to congestion and speeding already. So we should probably get that part of the of the uh, yeah. diagram into there. Yeah, so this is this is the magic television kitchen, right? For the cooking show where when you click mm -hmm. the button, yeah. the semi cooked piece pops out of the oven. Um, so those were our other factors. Um, VMT more VMT leads to more congestion, right? Yeah. All right, what else? Some, some earlier comments uh, highlight decreased congestion lead to higher vehicle speeds. All right. So congestion inversely related to, or negatively correlated with speed, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah. And also vehicle speed increased fatal crashes. Um, can I take the liberty of going that it, it increases the share of crashes that are fatal? Seems to me it does do that. I think that's the mechanism. We could debate this. I think that's the mechanism. So, because the other, the other possibility would be that this goes straight across like that. Um, but I think it's more that it goes to the share 
because we don't know if vehicle speed actually increases the total number of fatal crashes because that depends on how many crashes there are. The more crashes there are, all else equal, the more fatal crashes there are. Now, all else might not be equal. But I would argue that it's better to do that and then that finish it by making that making that one all right does that look right are the are, is anybody in the chat disagreeing with that or any other perspectives on that yeah um i don't think so if we want to shift a little bit we have some comments about um the level of experience of uh Maybe there are new cyclists on the road who, mm. yeah. So that might increase VRU exposure. Um, there are also comments linking VMT to VRU exposure as well. So I would say you get inexperienced cyclists taking to the roads that decreases your average cyclist experience level. And that decrease is increasing how exposed they are on average when they ride, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the link to the rest of the model is that more leisure walking and biking leads to a lower experience level on average because those who are experienced cyclists might be those who commute at, on a bicycle. Mm. Or at least those who are more dealing with aggressive driving it's not it's yeah yeah right yeah if you've got the people who in the past maybe biked on vacation on a protected bike path coming out and going to the grocery store in order to stay off the bus and because they aren't going to gym or school um so leisure walking and biking if that were to increase it would decrease there might be a mechanism in there that we're missing but move on We'll just put that direct. Later on, you could go back and you could say, mm, I don't know. I don't know how to represent that in putting numbers in there. I need some other thing in there. And then we left this one without a polarity. So VMT increases that increases how exposed your VRUs are. If you consider that exposure is some combination of how many there are, how experienced they are, how many, how much and then literally how exposed they are to the traffic around them. So there, you could break this down into more pieces and you might need to when you're trying to calculate this if you were really simulating. Um, On that note, there's a comment or a question, I guess, about whether it would be better in modeling to split between peak VMT and off-peak VMT. And I think um, maybe when going more detail, that would be a good next step to take. But at this level, I don't know if we're there yet. Yeah. Yeah. We definitely, I think we talked about that actually when we were setting up this exercise and we came to the conclusion that with yeah. the level of detail, we, yeah. what was our conclusion? Right. What you just said, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's absolutely I the think point that, that this, yeah. Go on, Jinx, so sorry. I think we discussed there are different ways to uh, split the VMT. Like for example, you can uh, split the VMT driven by uh, work-related uh, trips or like non-work-related. Hmm. And then maybe there are some new purpose of traveling and uh, we can create new categories to re uh, reflect the changes of the purpose of activities. And then I think that's kind of a, the um, valuable part of having this modeling framework allow you to expand the part you'll feel there could be more details within each of the components. It'll be like share, I won't go all the way into this. I think this is really interesting, but we don't have time to get into all of it, but it'd be something like mm -hmm. share a VMT for work, work home trips, homework trips. And then 
that I think has to sit there a little on its own because fraction of schools and businesses open, well, what if we, it's not quite work home trips, it's like um, work home or, so homework or home school trips. So then if this fraction of businesses is higher, that would be higher. In this case, they're lower, but that's a positive link. And then where you go with this, how it ties in there, you need to explode your VMT there out into more pieces, which we won't do. But we can leave a sort of flag there that if you were doing this more completely, you would come back to it. How about congestion tying into these pieces here? So we have a comment saying that more congestion leads to higher crash rate per BMT. Um, is everybody, does everybody agree but there's with also that? There's now disagreement, yeah. 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 Is so why, why yeah, is it? I know. Um, Does it go by a speed? speed they're saying, yeah. 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 Your, your, your issue, this is Scott again, your, your, I think your issue is that I think your congestion may well, well, first, more VMT goes also to more total crashes. Your congestion may have more crashes per VMT, but then it, it's got a negative relationship with the severity of the crashes, with the, with the fatal crashes. So, uh, so, so another way of saying that, and with, with less congestion, you have fewer crashes, but ones you do have may be more severe. If we go with that, have we captured that properly? So less VMT goes to less congestion. Less congestion on average, the vehicles are traveling faster. That they're traveling faster, so there are more crashes per VMT. Of course, there might be fewer overall crashes. I think there's a mistake here. Yeah. I think I think I would argue, do people agree that this no wait, I don't know. You can see you can see that even though we cooked up this exercise, there's it's still open to plenty of debate. That's one of the things I wanted to bring forward that we would have seen more if we were doing it on tables, but I'm glad it's coming out here. So all right. Scott, help us untangle this. Or people in the chat pod. Oh. So congestion. Okay, I would have first, you want to go from VMT to total crashes, everything else being equal. But that's a direct, that doesn't depend on congestion, right? That was right. Okay. Right, yeah. Because yeah. it's just yeah. more exposure, more bad things happen. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, my, my chat panel is covered up as part of the bag. I'm going to fix that. Okay. <laughs> then, Yes, congestion is negative of vehicle speed, and then you know, the, high, the faster you go, is a higher share of fatal crashes, and also higher higher speed may lead to more crashes per, uh, per, per VMT. VMT. So, and then there's some link heat. Oh, sorry, finish. I, I thought this. Was... Well, if you have higher crashes per VMT, then that's a positive link to more crashes, total crashes. As, right, uh, all else equal. Exactly. Yeah. As, as uh, thank you, Rob, for Robert, for putting that in the chat pod. Uh, yes, it would be crashes per day or month or something. That's absolutely right, Mark. So we probably want to yeah. think about crash rates. Yeah.
Yeah, that will get to the question of how we measure those factors. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Anna, someone has on in. pointed out that we haven't yet identified any feedback loops nope. that link the aspects back in. So maybe that can be another a point next to identify. Good point. Um, I think there are, there are a lot of sort of circles here, but they aren't loops. Like you go from VMT causal link to congestion to speed to cut, like, but you're not coming back to VMT. So we, I believe, do not have any loops yet. Yeah. Yeah. They. So are there any? Sorry, Scott. Oh well, I. Uh, or maybe I'll just put it in the chat part. Is that the one loop we found? Please. Well, let's see if can people come up with the one loop. We, yeah, we came yeah. up with one loop while we were practicing with this. Um, the does having more fatal crashes that, change anything? Yeah. The one that I see suggested is that more fatal crashes will reduce vehicle speed by uh, people realizing consequences of speeding or through speed enforcement sometimes. Um, I'll call it speed enforcement. I don't, I don't know yeah. if it's awareness or if it, it's police action or something, but that's a really, that's a good point. That's not one we actually caught. The more fatal crashes lead to, there might be an interim thing like leads to the police redeploying resources towards that or something. I have seen an awful lot of police cars sort of hanging out in yeah. neighborhood streets recently. And I wonder if it's for that. Um, and I, oh, yeah, finish, finish that. We have one more. Thank you, Joe. Uh, fatal <laughs> crashes de decreased in comfort of public spaces. Let me point out one thing. That's definitely true. But I think there might be a delay on this one. I don't know how quickly you'd need to, you know, about Jeremy's comment about how he uses yeah. his his degrees other than straight engineering and planning. You would, you might want to, you know, it would be great to be looking at something about human factors or behavior. How, how many tickets until you change your behavior? How many fatal crashes until the police focus more on that, et cetera. So um, people may feel like they have more important fish to fry as it, during the pandemic, you know, to some extent. So fatal crashes goes where, Scott? Comfort with public spaces? Yep, yep. So more fatal crashes make people less comfortable. So now I think we're gonna run out of time soon. We can finish up by identifying yeah. these loops. So the fatal crash one, so vehicle speed, if vehicle speed increases, share of crashes that are fatal increases, all else equal fatal crashes increases, all else equal speed enforcement increases, and that leads people to decrease their vehicle speed. So that's a balancing loop. Um, and we can actually label that. It comes out looking funky. So there's a balancing loop there where vehicle speed starts to increase and it triggers a reaction that makes it decrease again. And then here, Ian, do you want to walk us through the loop from comfort with public spaces over to fatal crashes and back? Sure. So as um, comfort with public spaces increases, transit ridership uh, would also increase. Um, that would decrease the MT. Uh, let's Okay, so we're going in that we're going in the absent of pandemic way, yes, which is yes, fine. Yes. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, which would increase congestion, uh -huh. Uh -huh. which would decrease vehicle speed, which would increase the share of crashes that are fatal, which would increase the number of fatal crashes which would decrease comfort with public spaces. So that one is 
balancing, but I believe there's also a reinforcing in there as well if we go a different way from BMT. So this one here is balancing. Let's see, so yeah. comfort with public spaces. This is interesting because you can show that, it, I appreciate your saying that, showing it with the sort of positive case, because the loop should have mm -hmm. the same sign. Doesn't matter if you're saying pandemic severity was up or was down, the loop should have the same behavior, like they should either be balancing or reinforcing. So comfort with public spaces in the anti-pandemic case is up, transit ridership is up, BMT is down, um, conge congestion is up, right, is it, no, VMT is down. Uh, congestion is down. Congestion is down, yeah, congestion is down. Um, vehicle speed is up. Vehicle speed is up, crashes per VMT is up. We're going a different route now. Crashes per time period is up. Fatal crashes is up and comfort public space is down. So that one's balancing too. So I think there's a third route, which is reinforcing. We're gonna get it. Comfort public spaces is up. Transit ridership is up. VMT is down. Total crashes per time period reached directly is also down. Because people are on the bus rather than crashing, rather than exposing themselves to crashes by driving. Um, fatal crashes is down, and people are happier to come out to public space. So we got it. We we found the reinforcing loop in there. Whew. All right. I think there also nice. is one if you go go via. Uh, oh, in our, I was thinking of our example where we also had a link from comfort with public spaces over to leisure walking and biking, and that creates another loop. So I don't know how I'll draw the yeah, link yeah. here. Do we have time it's a little to messy, do? But... Yeah, obviously, if you were going to go mm -hmm. further, you'd want to try to rearrange this. Yeah. Hey, public public space. Yeah. Should yeah, I think we back want up to on time. This part. Of... Well, also because there's some interesting general questions which I want to make sure we get to. Okay. That are not not just about the exercise. I don't want to do that now or finish up the presentation. Well, so the only thing left, first of all, I want to, I really want to save this because I'm really interested in um, yeah. the actual one during webinar. I'd love to go back and look at it. I was talking about how um, group models get more ideas. Well, you guys found a couple of loops and things we never spotted. So that's a perfect yeah. um, explanation of that. So, Scott, maybe... There were there are two slides left, sort of about conclusions about SD. Do the questions seem like they should go before or after that? I do them now, if that's okay. Uh, Perfect. The one this came on early on is uh, COVID nineteen causes less ridership in utilizing buses. Can you use optimization instead of simulation? So the optimization simulation question. So in other words, can you set an objective function and solve for, for instance, something like how much bus service you should provide? Is that the question? Um, While you're looking, I will say that there are, there is a lot of work on linking system dynamics with other fields. So with agent-based modeling, um, with, there is work on linking it with operations research and optimization. Um, I don't recall where that stands. The kind of thing you sort of hear about at an annual dynamics conference, but I haven't, I have to say I haven't worked on that piece. So I can't really answer that question mm. better than that. Other thoughts yeah. on that or a follow-up to explain? We have um, someone comment saying some SD tools can um, just do that to optimize. And then 
such as Power Sim Studio can do it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Finding finding the parameters that would that would best match your the data you're looking at in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Awesome. Thank you very much. Oh. So I. Sorry, I'm just scanning. Uh, I think the the next general comment which I'll make is was a, you know, a more specific and measurable pandemic sever severity could be if there is an official lockdown or quarantine. Uh, and I think. You know, you raise a good point here because in the end, you know, this is really just the first step. But then you want to be able to find something that's measurable so you can actually build a quantitative model. So, yes, pandemic severity is the, the general concept, but certainly, you know, as you build a real model, you're going to want to find a way to quantify that. Absolutely. And then a question was, is this only a visual model or you run something in back? Uh, and I think it's yes to both, and others can elaborate on that. So yeah, this literally right now, this is only a visual model. Where you would go with this if you were, this is a perfect segue actually, where you would go with this if you were building a model where something could run in back is you would need to determine which are the places here where you would need to move from a causal loop diagram into what's called a stock flow diagram. So you would be determining which are the places here where something accumulates over time. And then you'd be using the causal loops to, in, to determine how those accumulations over time are changing. And then you would be able to put equations into that and which so for instance, literally how you would do it in this is you would, you would have to, well, you would be putting something in there. I don't want to make this events in that, but the idea is you would be linking this in with, based on the thing. So here we have cars per capita and comfort with public spaces. This is two points that feed into that. And what's the relationship from that? So you'd be putting in the mathematical link there and then you could run it, but that's many steps away because you would still, you would first need to make the stock flow diagram, which I don't think we can get into much, but maybe my colleagues have something to comment about that. It might be a, I have a transition comment. to what we have in the slides too. Yeah, well, we, yeah. Uh, I have a comment on the pandemic severity. I think another thing we, when we kind of trying to develop this framework is we know um, some of the factors you can measure, but how people make decisions are based on their per perceived uh, levels. So maybe there are some measures to reflect the overall pandemic severity, but for different type of people, their perceived severity could vary, depends upon the, the information they receive and then the, the surrounding they observe, how, how other people react to the pandemic. So I think what is good for this modeling framework, it allows you to add the part to understand uh, how you measure some objective utilities versus how people will perceive, how people's perceived utility can be influenced by the uh, so-called like objective uh, utility. And then use that as a way to see what, how people react to the changes to the utility of the system. So I might take the liberty of going um, we're, we're I feel like we're running out of time and I want to make sure we get the discussion. So Jing so if if we skip the or if we do really, really fast our the remaining slides, um, let me let me put them back on share. Um, I feel like they're important, but we need to get through them really fast because I want to show the last one, which is the example of a, of a system dynamics model that was on transportation, which might make things a little bit clearer. Um, come back here and share my screen. Whoa.
All right, do people see the screen again? The PowerPoint slide? Yes. Yep. Yes. All right, let me let me zip through this. Um, so why is the system dynamics perspective useful for strategic transportation planning? You can read everything on the slide. The point I want to make is it is focused on representing the structure of the system and the decision rules that drive the people in it so that you focus on representing each piece of the system and then overall behavior can be sort of emergent from that at its best. I think that, that to me, that's what excites me the most about it. Um, and while doing it, you are explicitly modeling, I mean, as we do in travel modeling in general, the people don't know everything when they make decisions. So there's no sort of eye in the sky directing um, everything. It's, it, behavior emerges out of real things that real people do every day. Um, and because you're using a wider, a broader sort of system boundary, you are able to spot links where cause and effect are not right next to each other in space or time, which can be very helpful. Um, and we got a little bit of that when we we're talking about how you know car ownership changes are longer, um, but might come back to affect transit in a way we weren't thinking about when we we're thinking about our initial reaction. And in system dynamics models also are not assuming we'll get to equilibrium. So let me pass it over to Jing Su to say a little bit more about comparing SD models with traditional travel demand modeling approaches. Uh, thank you, Hannah, for summarizing the SD approach. So to tie today's presentation back to trans, uh, travel demand modeling, the system dynamic uh, modeling is a complementary, uh, complementary tool to travel demand models in several ways. And then here we had a three points. The first one is SD models address the comp, uh, complex interactions among agents and then their response to large numbers of va uh, variables versus travel demand models need to make assumptions on the sequence of the decisions and then hardly build many feedback loops across modeling phases. And then um, second, uh, SD models do not rely on the assumption that equilibrium states of the system uh, will always exist, um, or maybe there could be some um, multiple equilibrium there in the system. So we want the, the models to kind of like tell us where the patterns will go. And then lastly, SD models are very flexible in reflecting new features such as adding and modeling the impact of new modes on the uh, behavior of a system. So um, in general, and the conclusion, as Jeremy mentioned, SD models can help travel demand modelers to explore the impact of factors in many different dimensions and that can help modelers to gain insights on the magnitude of the impact of various factors. And, and then like uh, as modelers, we can decide where to invest resources and energy to extend their current models uh, to do the travel demand forecasting. Okay, Great. Hannah, thank you. Thank you. I have to get them. Okay. Um, so this is the last slide. This is the one I wanted to make sure we got to see. Um, for those who were asking, how do you put a real model behind the loop? Um, so this is a fairly often cited paper um, from the literature looking at transition challenges for alternative fuel, fuel vehicle and transportation systems. So looking at what would be the uh, scenarios under which we would see a change over to um, electric or other sort of other drivetrains from internal combustion. So in order to do this, remember what Jeremy was saying and that I picked up on at the beginning that you know you can look at the past to inform the future even if things are behaving differently. So the authors um, in the figures at the left, which are taken, all of this is taken from the paper, they looked at the transition from horses to vehicles and they also looked at the transition among types of locomotion, different, different platforms um, in the early days of cars. So electric, for instance, has already had a heyday, but internal combustion beat it out in, in partly because um, it was easier to build a fueling infrastructure where there were bicycle, it was common to have bicycle mechanics in many small towns and those people put in um, gas tanks or became internal combustion um, um, uh, mechanics. And so it became, uh, so, 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 so the, 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 the outside factors, sort of sociological factors made it easier for internal combustion to take over. Um, and now, obviously, we have those as an entrenched part of our system. So, Struman and 
Strubin and Sturman looked at this past data, identified from it that there were four key causal effects. One is social exposure to the new platform, how, what you hear, you know, are you aware of it? Word of mouth, so what people are saying about it. How big the existing platform's installed base and support infrastructure is, and how innovation changes. So for instance, on the bottom left diagram, that red line are the total number of producers. So originally there were very, very many OEMs and then it's dropped off. Um, and so from that, they were able to build a model. Um, they calibrated to run simulations of possible electric vehicle deployment curves in different scenarios. And you can see a little bit on the right, what we would call a stock flow diagram. So for instance, the installed base is something that accumulates over time and there's a flow of sales into it and discards out of it. That would be the next step that we would have gone to with our pandemic VMT model. Um, this is still obviously a diagram that's very high level so that they can re represent it in a paper, but you would explode this into all its detail. The actual model is publicly available online and there are many screens of it, um, but that's sort of where you would go in making it into a real working model. And from that, Let's go to the discussion. Um, maybe I should ask you, Elizabeth, we're, we're running short on the official time allotted. Were you able to uh, prolong the Zoom, sort of Zoom reservation yes. so that if we run over, those who are able to stay can? Yes. So I think that you can take okay. a, few, um, a few questions and have discussions. Uh, in the next four minutes and then officially close it and then you could stay after for a chat just like you would in a normal session. Sounds great. So obviously we can take questions from you. We also have questions for you. You know, how is this uh, relevant in your work? How might you use these ideas in your work? What are some of the bigger ideas that it brings to mind? And then I should also put in a plug for our upcoming research at the Volpe Center where we're looking at modeling proxy modes, modes that can represent how automated vehicles might behave. Um, and we would be looking forward to collaborate with practitioners on that. So if you have data or you're interested in talking with us more about that, we'd love to hear from you. We can do that offline as well. Um, so now we can, you can raise your hands and we can unmute people to, to uh, ask their questions. Scott, I'll let you start. Uh, I just saw on the, on the chat pod, uh, put in a plug for the SD conference. Uh, I'll mention uh, the Professional Society on System Dynamics. You have the link right here on the slide. And they're doing their annual conference, I believe in July. It was to have been in Norway, but instead it's online. So if you're interested, Take a look at, if you're interested, take a look at that website. A lot of good resources there. Um, and I also saw that Len Malchinsky, who may yeah. be an organizer this year, had raised his hand. Maybe you can recognize him and he can ask a question or say a word. Okay, Len, you should now be yes. able to say a word. Can you hear me? Yes, yes perfectly. Yeah, I, I just happen to be the VP meetings for the society right now. First thing I want to say is this was fantastic. I'm, we're all, you know, we're always looking for converts to the system dynamics methodology. This was fantastic. Uh, there's a lot of good information out there. When you go to the website, you might want to check, I believe it's publications and past conferences to see lots and lots of papers on transportation issues writ large uh, from all kinds of things to, to, uh, drivetrain choices, uh, safety. And then the other thing, there's a there's an original model built in 1980 that I wanted everyone to make, be aware of at Dartmouth University called N-TRANS, E-N-T-R-A-N-S. Uh, you can get it through the NTIS, the Federal Government National Technical Information Service. I believe you can get the PDFs for free well worth reading to see how some of the original work in system dynamics was done in transportation modeling. And again, thank you so much. Fantastic work. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you for the. Thank you. Nice to have a vote of confidence from um, somebody that involved in SD for that long. So I appreciate it. Thank you, uh, think, Matt, think, uh, Matt. Matthew Conway. 
Scott, can I just, I think I'm supposed to show the final slide because it's 4.30 and then we'll stay on. Okay, then, um, all right, sorry. Sorry, no, I'm Then, sorry. Matthew, if you, if you can stay on, we'll get to you right after Hannah does the final slide. No problem. There's our contact information. Um, this was the one you'll be receiving, I believe, from the organizers a, a survey, and this is the list of the upcoming um, events and webinars. Okay, those who can stay on, I'm, I, I and I think all of the panelists um, are good to stay. So, yes, please. So, so yeah, I wanted to ask about, at Matt Conway with Arizona State, I wanted to ask about um, how you would, if you were evaluating uh, multiple scenarios, like was talked about in the first presentation, and you got, say, different results for two different scenarios, how would you know that those are, that difference is like statistically significant? Is there a way to put some kind of a confidence interval on the outputs of this approach? Well, actually, this is um, can I can I can I answer yeah, that question? Please. This is Jeremy. Sure. Um, that you know the the point here for all of these models, and I, I think this is one of the distinctive features, is to say that we're not trying to predict, or or we put no particular store in the specific numeric outcome of the model. What we're interested in is the dynamics. That is, how does it bend when we push on it? And so, yeah. the the question with that says. The really interesting factor is, do we have among, you know, we can test this, we can look at the model responsiveness to small portions of movement in areas that we think we understand really well and know what should happen, and ask ourselves, is the response what we, we, we expect? So there, the emphasis is really much more on sensitivity testing, on, you know, reasonableness of the relationships that we're encoding. And then the questions that we ask with these models has to do with, under a lot of different variable inputs, what are the movements and which way does it go? And so, and so the question is not about, you know, we're certainly, you know, we want to be as confident as we can in the assumption, but the point here is to be able to test out the variabilities in the areas around which we do not have confidence. And, and so we're really trying to elucidate how big a shift might this be? How important would that be? You know, what kinds of interventions could we make to attempt to, uh, to uh, reduce the response if it's a big one that we want smaller? And, and so that's really the kind of question. So we have to learn, I mean, one of the challenges with this kind of modeling is to learn different approaches to thinking about what is this thing actually telling us? What's the relationship of these numbers to reality? And it's much more interesting to compare different outputs of the same model once we've, we've essentially convinced ourselves that what it does is reasonable than it is to say, oh, and if we have this specific magic combination of inputs, we're gonna get this specific output. I mean, we're really far, far away from that in the context in which these models are most applicable. I'll stop. So if I could just follow up real quick. So if I had two, you know, possible policy options that I was considering as a decision maker that maybe have different costs and other things that aren't in the model associated with them, how would I decide how much weight to put on the output of the model versus, you know, other factors? How, how confident could I be in the output of the model is telling me, you know, the correct ordering of those two outcomes, even if we don't know the size of the effect? Well, I, you know, and, and I, I guess that let's back up a second and say, what does it mean to have confidence in the outputs? Because I, I and, and I think this, this is a subtle point. I'm not sure I'm going to get it right. So maybe Scott or Hannah can help me after I talk for a minute to it. Sure. But the point, the point we're trying, the thing we're trying to do with this is in advance, as we build the model, and this goes back to the example that we were putting together, the factors that we're considering, the, the effects that we're worried about are things that in some sense matter to us. That is, if we get a big increase in VMT, this is gonna have a cascade of mm -hmm. negative effects perhaps that we'd like to try to bring under control. Or if we get a big you know, increase in crashes, that's gonna be worse And VMT and adjusting that is one of the things that we might try to influence to get a better outcome. That, what we have preloaded into the set of scenarios and the relationships that we've developed and the rest is a sense of what matters in the world, what's important. And so almost a priori, we've decided that if we see a big shift in a particular performance metric at the output of this model system that we have carefully crafted mm. to represent what we know and what we're concerned about, that says something and it's, it's, you know, that's an important thing. So to go back to the example that I cited for vision eval in relationship to the greenhouse gases, we're trying to get a 70% reduction in Oregon because that was legislatively mandated. And we have a series of policies, some of which are going to be hard to implement politically 
but would get us a big bang for the buck. And what we're interested in doing with the model is playing around with combinations that help us find combinations of easier to do things. And, you know, so we're not just saying to people, everybody has to stay home. I mean, we've seen how well that's worked over the last couple of months. But uh, I mean, that's, yeah, it solves the greenhouse gas problem, but it's unsustainable. We can't do it politically and socially. So we have to find other mechanisms. And what the model is hoping to do for us is to say, well, there's a little bit of that we could do and a little bit of this other thing and some of these other combinations. And oh, look, there's a synergy over here. If we can do both of these things, we're going to get more than doing either one individually. Those are the kinds of explorations. And, and what we're trying to do is you know, figure out a response based on these, these decisions we've made about what's important and what we're actually trying to detect with the model based on the combinations of inputs. I'm going to stop with that and just see if that made any sense. Of yeah, that helps a lot. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think all, all I saw in this, this is Scott, I'll, you know, just add that, uh, you know, there's the old saying, all models are wrong, some models are useful. Uh, and certainly, you know, certainly true here, but I think the value here, and, and I'll, I'll, let me back up, it's like, what got us into this work was the question, the very broad question, what will automated vehicles mean to the transportation system? And we realized that, yeah, this is a big, big question. <laughs> And so we wanted to kind of build a framework that might even help to identify tipping points, right? You know, input goes this way. Uh, if input goes one way, you know, some mode will really take off. But if the input just goes a little bit the other way, then it will just fizzle. Uh, situations like that, we wanted to be able to unearth situations like that and do some sensitivity analysis around them. Thank you. Okay, Len, your hand is still up. Did you want to say something? Uh, again, whoever the other participants are, I obviously don't know, but you guys are right on the money. Uh, the all models are wrong. The sensitivity, once you go from causal loop diagramming into a runnable model with some quantification, you've got a mini world there and you can test the heck out of it. You can test it for things that might not be politically or even physically possible. And boy, does that give you a great understanding of the system and what Dana Meadows used to call the leverage points. So simulation is nice. Uh, do some really cool things. You're, you guys are doing great. Well, thank you. All right, well, Hannah, any uh, closing words? Uh, well, this is Scott. I just want to thank everyone mm -hmm. who attended and added comments to the chat pod. Hope you found it worth your time. And if you'd like to talk with us further, we'd love to. Hannah? Um, yes, I agree with everything Scott said. Thank you all very much. It was really I'm um, trying to get back to there so we can, we'll leave our contact info on the screen there. Um, it's been, it's been a great journey over the last few years, uh, kind of melding my interest with system dynamics um, from my grad program about 10 years ago into um, my work with DOT. I actually, I took system dynamics with Jeroen Strubin when he was teaching at McGill, which is where I did my master's. And that was right when that paper I just showed you about alternative fuel was coming out and he was always talking about it. So for me, it's really exciting to be able to kind of come full circle and bring these pieces together. And I really appreciate having Len here to um, add some more context from someone that's been in this a heck of a lot longer than, than I have. Um, so we would, yeah, we would love to hear from you. Um, I don't know if, um Rachel or um if Rachel, if Rachel Copperman or um Elizabeth Saul want to say any closing notes about um any of the upcoming Zephyr things or anything else 
from the organizers this perspective. Is we appreciate your efforts in putting this together. This is Elizabeth Saul. Thank you so much, Hannah. I, um, this was a great uh, session to kick off our virtual learning session series. Um, and if you want to find some more, if you go to zephyrtransport.org, we're going to be having two to three a month. And if you want to respond to the survey that will be coming to your inbox, that can help influence what those look like and what the future topics are. So I'd appreciate that. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Hi.